Okay, hello everyone and welcome to this webinar today. I'm Francis Healy from Global Debt 21 and Enfield Voices. And this is one of the webinars we're doing where I'm not going to be involved in it, which is one of the sort of webinars I like doing. And we've got three members of NCAF Youth, the Enfield Climate Change Action Forum, and they're going to interview Lara Rudar, who is from Dubai. We thought it'd be great to do this because all over the world, young people are in protest about carbon emissions and the impact on climate change. And we know it's a huge worldwide problem. And the generation that's going to be affected the most is not mine, it's theirs. And so we thought to have a sort of cross-border conversation between young people here and Laura would be really useful to talk about what each other's doing so we can learn from them. So I'm going to introduce Olivia first because Olivia is going to chair this meeting on behalf of NCAF Youth. She'll introduce everyone else and I'm sure she'll ask the first question or pass it on to someone else. So um, Olivia, do you want to start? And uh, welcome Laura to this webinar. Hi, um, welcome Lara. It's amazing to have you on and some of the things that you've been doing um, for the planet is just amazing at such a young age. I mean, we were very inspired by you. Um, so yeah, I'm Olivia. Um, I'm 17 years old and I'm part of NCAF Youth. And today uh, we'll just be asking you some questions about your views on climate change and some of the work that you've been doing. So yeah, I'll pass over to Kim or Anishree. Maybe you guys would like to introduce yourselves too. Yeah, I can go next. Um, I'm Anishree, I'm also 17 and I'm also part of NCAF, NCAF Youth. Um, and we're really excited to talk to you today and hear about all the amazing things that you've been doing. Hi, my name is Kim. Um, I'm part of NCAF Youth as well. Um, looking into your work, I've seen we're the same age as you, and it's been amazing to see like all the incredible things you've done. Um, really excited to know more about what you else you're doing and what you're gonna do. It's wonderful to meet you all. <laughs> yeah, it's lovely to meet you. So I'll start off with the first question, um, just about your project. So. When did your passion for the environment begin and what inspired you to set up some of your projects? Well, um, I think my first kind of exposure to environmental issues was um, when I wrote this essay about sustainability education. And essentially a teacher at my school, I love her to death, honestly. Um, she basically wanted us to kind of apply to this competition and it was with the Living Rainforest. Um, and so this organization, essentially every year, they have an essay writing competition. And then the finalists get to um, be invited to different areas around the world to do a debate about these issues. And I was 11, um, I was in year six, I believe. Um, and yeah, it, I mean, I became a finalist and they invited me to go to Oxford to debate about these issues with so many different um, like kids and um, teenagers around the world. And for me, that was the first time when I kind of realized the extent of this problem and how universal it is. Because, I mean, I'm from Dubai, um, like I've been living here my whole life. And it's very different, like our issues are so different to issues in, I don't know, Nigeria or the UK. Um, so that was really the first time when I realized how many issues there are and the solutions to the issues as well, because um, lots of different people had lots of different things to say. So during those debates, I kind of realized, yeah, I want to continue doing this work. I want to continue to educate myself and also others um, about these issues. And hopefully maybe one day there'll be people younger than me who are inspired by me and want to continue to do this work as well. So that's kind of my story. <laughs> That's really good. Um, and I think our next question is, well, you're a, UAE, you're a UAE ambassador for nature. And I think you work closely with the Emirates Nature WWF. So I was just kind of wondering what your responsibilities are within these roles. So um, I applied to become an ambassador last year. Um, and this was during the pandemic. So essentially our GCSEs were cancelled. I was like, you know, this is fantastic. I have so much free time to do um, new projects to kind of focus on my advocacy as well. Um, so there was an open call for applications and I applied, you know, stating my um, work, my previous work with the environment. 
and I got accepted to be one of the youngest. Um, so the other ambassadors, there are 20 of us, they come from so many different areas. I mean, a few of them are engineers, a few of them are designers, or, you know, physicists, and they're all working towards nature. So my roles and responsibilities are very connected to theirs. And um, we kind of work together to create different campaigns to really engage the youth of the UAE um, to really talk about these different issues because many people don't really know about the extent of um, issues in Dubai because I feel like we're in a bit of a bubble. And we use so much electricity because it's so hot all the time. So we have air conditioning on 24 seven. Everything is like, if you've seen some of the skyscrapers, everything is covered in windows. So it's, it gets really hot again. And it's just not a sustainable way to live. Um, but the country has been doing a few projects. So for me, it's just trying to reach youth to kind of push for action as well. Um, obviously due to COVID-19, all our outreach programs became online. They used to be outdoors and, you know, people from all the different schools um, would come and like attend these events like nature hikes, um, beach cleanups, um, different workshops, but it was all online. So we had to do them on Zoom and um, we had different, you know, digital campaigns to kind of further educate um, people. We also had movie nights, which were really fun. So um, we watched David Attenborough's um, documentaries and everything. So that was really nice. <laughs> yeah, I love his documentaries. I watched them all day. <laughs> Um, so I have another question for you. Um, you are you have a role as an educational coordinator at the REAF initiative. As an educator, what do you think is the most important of climate education? And how do you think we should integrate climate education into our curriculum at schools? Yeah, I mean, I feel as though climate education is one of the biggest um, solutions to climate change. Because obviously, if you don't understand the problem, you can't solve it. It's just like a math problem, you know, like if you don't actually know how to do math, how can you ever solve this algebraic expression? So um, for me, it's all about giving um, teenagers or children the tools um, to understand this issue. But then most importantly, um, gives like advice and solutions to kind of combat it. So with Riyadh, um, it's more our mission is to make the climate movement accessible to everyone, because many people, as you said, don't have it in their curriculums and they might not have lessons related to the environment. Um, so through social media, through different webinars that we organize, um, different you know campaigns, we try to um, educate as many youth as we can in a very, um, I guess, cost effective way because everything's online. Um, and yeah, we're currently working on a book. Um, so that kind of brings in different interviews, different um, speeches, and um, it's basically like a textbook to environmental activism, you know, how you can be an activist in the 21st century, um, you know, with different templates, worksheets, things that you can do. So I think that's really exciting. And it'd be great to have like, just people, um, run their own clubs at school maybe. Um, I think right now it's more about youth are really taking it upon themselves to educate themselves. I mean, I'm a strong believer that climate um, education and all these environmental issues should be integrated in school curriculums, um, but it's not really happening. So now this is what we've come to as youth trying to do ourselves and educating the people around us. Um, so yeah, I mean, honestly, I really think that there should be a separate lesson, like moral education or something where, you know, just one hour a week where children would learn about different issues. Um, because once you know how to combat it, then you can, so, yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think uh, we should definitely be learning more about climate change in schools. And I think governments have a responsibility to provide us with that education. So kind of like leading on from what governments should be doing, um, like in 2015, the UAE was the 29th highest carbon dioxide emitter. So my question to you is, do you think that more wealthier nations are doing enough to reduce their carbon emissions? Or do you think that they should take more responsibility considering that they're contributing the most? Yeah, that's actually a very big debate um, within the climate movement all about you know um, carbon emissions because um, developing countries are very pressured to reduce their carbon emission 
emissions whilst um, you know, developed um, countries had already had their industrial revolution and became more developed. And now they have the technology and um, you know, the funding to actually go greener and more sustainable. So I really believe that instead of really pressuring these um, developing countries to not use coal, not use um, fossil fuels, these developed countries should try and um, make you know, reusable energy and, for example, solar panels and all these different technologies as cheap as possible so that the value or because, I mean, fossil fuels are expensive. So if we have a different um, kind of energy that is cheaper, then obviously these countries will be using it. So I feel as though developing developed countries have responsibility to kind of share this knowledge and use their resources to kind of help all the different countries as well to further go into a more equitable and sustainable future. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously with all their different <sighs> industries um, and the things that are happening, they do have a responsibility to limit their carbon emissions. My friend in the UK, she's actually suing the UK government um, right now. She just started a campaign. So, I mean, yeah, the things that go behind the scenes that we might necessarily, we might not necessarily see. I mean, there's some shady stuff going on, you know, governments funding fossil fuel industries, um, them actually paying fossil fuel industries to pollute. So, you know, we need justice, we need climate and environmental justice. Yeah, exactly. Um, and kind of leading on from that, um, <laughs> what has the UAE been doing as a whole to reduce their contribution to the climate crisis? And do you think that this is enough? Yeah, so um, we've had a lot of projects um, run by the government. Um, our biggest one is, I think, the solar panels, because obviously Dubai is a desert. So we have an abundance of natural sunlight. And um, gosh, I'll try and get the statistics up. But essentially, they're, they're building or they've already built this huge um, like plant where all the different um, like energies from the city are actually being taken from these solar panels. Um, because obviously a desert is a desert, so you might as well use the area of land. Um, so that's one thing. And then obviously we have the expo coming up. Um, it was supposed to be this year, but it's happening in September. So that of course will bring new technologies and there's a lot of emphasis on sustainability. And I feel as though living in Dubai, um, the country has realized that they can't depend on oil anymore because it's obviously running out. So now they're going into the different sector of like information and knowledge. So they're thinking like, okay, in the future, um, reusable energies and all these technologies are, gonna, are going to be really profitable. So we might as well start, um, you know, developing these technologies and developing these frameworks so that we can profit off it in the future. I think that's my, I mean, it might not be the case, but they have the resources, they have the money from all this oil. So I think hopefully they'll be using it for good and try and reverse um, all the things that they've done. Yeah. It's weird. <laughs> I mean, if you research it, honestly, I'm working with the Abu Dhabi Environmental Agency and they are doing a lot of stuff. Um, and yeah, they just have the money to do so. So why why not, you know? Yeah, it's really good to hear that they're advancing forwards and coming up with new ways to do things like that. Um, and kind of following on from the government theme, um, I think it's become apparent that climate change isn't just an ecological problem. It's become a social issue and it's affecting different races, different genders and classes di disproportionately. Um, so do you think that governments and climate agreements are recognizing these injustices enough? No, <laughs> to be frank, honestly, um, I've had this discussion with my friends um, who have actually gone to the COP um, you know, the United Nations climate conferences. And it is predominantly, there's a very big emphasis on Europeans and these nations, right? So all the actual nations who are disproportionately affected by this crisis 
they don't really have a say in it and they're not represented as much. Just like, you know, youth, um, I don't think where we are represented as much as we should be. Um, so yeah, honestly, climate or the environmental issues or climate justice is social justice because it's so intervo interwoven and there's so much intersection between, you know, different social issues and the environment for example like you could talk about i don't know the indigenous peoples of america or any other country they're the ones who are always championing for all this change but you know the colonizers they're always um threatening their land threatening with pollution pipelines so there is so much clash between this and also you know natural disasters the countries who are mostly affected by these um, by climate change and rising sea levels, the fluctuating, you know, I'm not going to go into science, but these countries aren't able to um, kind of go out of this situation as easily. So they're the ones who are being um, affected the most. So yeah, definitely, I feel as though they should be represented more, especially from um, the like South America and the, all, the, all these different regions. Um, yeah. <laughs> Completely agree with you. I think um, specific, specific groups do need more representation in politics and also in superpowers. Um, they just don't have as big as a say as um, we hope they would. Um, so my next question for you is, um, what actions have you taken to make sure your school is more sustainable? And what actions do you recommend for us to take to make sure our school improves as well? Um, I'm actually the head girl of my school <laughs> and um, yeah I mean Jess we've been very good I think with our you know, electricity water consumption and everything. Um, before Covid we had um, you know the water dispensers and everything so people would obviously bring their own um, water bottles or plastic cups. With Covid there was this issue where because we're back in school um, so this year they were like no this is really bad you know cross-contamination whatever so they introduced the plastic bottle machines and it was just a nightmare because literally nobody would bring their own water bottle people would drink like two bottles per day maybe even three so if you multiply that with every single year group and all the students like that is so many plastic water bottles I, I mean people say like oh there are bigger issues than just plastic consumption but that plastic will never disappear from like the face of this planet why would you if you have your own water bottle so yeah, we introduced like the new water dispensers where you would just press like the like pedal. So instead of like actually touching it, you wouldn't touch the crane or like anything at all. Um, so that was like one thing I was really happy about. And then we do, um, we have like a hydroelectric kind of garden thing. So a few schools actually do this, but um, they have like an aquarium and then that feeds into the vegetables and then the vegetables kind of compost and then it's like this whole cycle. I feel like composting and like um, with the worms and all of that, I think that would be such a great way to, um, you know, encourage younger students as well to, you know, get green. Um, but yeah, we have so many different clubs at our school as well. And our school, we don't have any textbooks or notebooks so everything is paperless um i mean obviously we need to understand that like most most of the um students at my school are quite privileged and we are able to afford our own like laptops so that's where we do all our work and we use like microsoft teams and i mean during the pandemic everything was online anyways with distance learning um but we kind of just continued that and so everything all our assignments and everything we, we type it on our computers and share it with our teachers um, so that I think greatly reduces the amount of um, paper that we use in our school as well. Wow that sounds amazing like some of the things your school is doing for hydroelectric garden I think it's the first I've ever heard of it it sounds like really good and what you said about plastic bottles and um, with, like plastic consumption at your school I, I'm just kind of wondering if people were aware of how much they were uh, polluting or contributing to the pollution of our planet and so kind of leads into my next question if people at your school have 
positive attitude towards climate change or was it kind of difficult for you to start the conversation and get young people involved in all your projects? Um, well, I'm lucky enough to have really supportive friends who, like, no matter what I do, they really want to be involved in the things that I do and really engaged. And honestly, like, they've helped me so much with all my different projects. So definitely there is a positive outlook. And that's what I find with youth. Um, they're so positive and optimistic and they really want to engage with different issues. Um, so it's just about opportunities and like making sure that they know that, you know, they can do this and they can attend this webinar and this conference, they can listen to all these different resources. Um, so yeah, I think mainly um, the outlook is really positive. And I mean, I have a few, few friends who led their own campaigns as well. So we have um, like a waitrose next to our school. So they took it upon themselves to like ban all the plastic bags and instead um, supply the like market with um, the reusable like cotton bags. So <laughs> my friend would stand every single day after school and he would come up to all these different shoppers and say please buy the cotton bag instead of buying the plastic bag and now um, whenever I go to that shop nobody's like buying the plastic bags because you know everyone has the cotton bag so it's all about I think um, changing the mindset of the communities because once one person starts um, doing something then the people around them will start doing it as well and then they will affect even more people so it's kind of like this ripple effect um, so yeah, I'm quite proud of my friends for all the work that they're doing as well. It's amazing that your friend managed to do that. That's really, really good. Um, and I mean, you're doing so many amazing projects yourself, as well as going to school and doing loads of things within your school and being head girl. Um, so I guess I was just kind of wondering how you manage your time as a young student and an activist and being able to spread awareness and do all the other things that you do um, in terms of activism. Yeah, um, it's definitely an issue that isn't talked about a lot. Um, there's this whole like culture within the climate movement where we feel as though we need to do everything and we need to try and help as much as we can. And when you give too much, well, not too much, but when you give so much of your energy towards um, something, you don't really have any left for yourself. And that can be quite um, training. And I've had moments where I was burnt out and, you know, I was like, I can't continue this. I need to um, maybe sacrifice some projects, maybe give them to other people um, for them to maybe let them develop and grow. Or I might have to like completely stop a project because it's affecting my mental health as well. And it's taking time away from, you know, being with friends and family. So, you know, I think there is a balance between this work and I try to make sure that, um, you know, I don't really... <laughs> kind of distance myself from other people and just focus on my work because sometimes that is the case you know with school with exams coming up um it is like that sometimes so it's important to know your boundaries and well not boundaries but you know the extent of work that you can do um to make sure that you don't get burnt out because when you do it is really hard and difficult to kind of um you know bounce back from that and that can affect everything in your life. So, yeah. And also my biggest advice would be to seek help. Like there are so many people around you that you might not know would want to help so much. So it's all about um, communicating with people to say, you know, if I have this project, I can't continue it. You know, there are so many people who would want to take over. So yeah, just speaking to your friends or like people online can be a really, help, a really good help. So there seems to be a lot of like struggles with such big responsibilities. Um, so I want to know um, what's the most challenging part as being of being an activist, and how has the pandemic affected this? Gosh, the biggest part. Um, I think sometimes I'm scared to speak out on different issues, um, and also living in the UAE there are strict guidelines about the things that you can say or actively speak out against. Like for example, we're not allowed to protest here. Um, so that's why my activism have, has taken a more educational approach rather than you know, protesting and kind of um, keeping different 
businesses and governments accountable. Um, so I've had to, well, not had to, but I'm fortunate enough to work with the government to like do these different initiatives. Um, so yeah, I think my biggest challenge, as I said, was kind of getting too much on my plate and then burning out. Um, but yeah, other than that, I think it's important to know what you stand for um, and you don't have to take everything at once. I mean, as I said before, the climate movement is so interlinked with, um, you know, social justice and all the different, like, there are so many things happening in the world. Um, and sometimes when you're seen as this ad activist or advocate, people expect you to speak out about everything. And as much as I would love to, it is um, draining and I can't really focus on all these different issues at once. So yeah, I think that's a challenge as well. Just people expecting a lot from you um, and you maybe not being able to deliver it. Yeah, I mean, it does sound like it, you kind of managed to somehow figure out, at least you recognize, I mean, like um, that you need to balance your mental health and your activism at the same time. And I mean, you've, you've you're like a, you're a filmmaker and a film director and it seems like maybe you found a way to combine your passions together like climate change and filmmaking um I mean we think it's really unique that you've kind of combined these two together especially at such a young age so I guess my question is like what do you wish to portray for your filmmaking um yeah I mean I started filmmaking at a very young age honestly it was just something I would do with my friends for fun um, our stories were really simple about like friendship or like bullying at school. Um, yeah, I mean, they weren't the best movies, but it was really fun. Um, so when I kind of realized that, you know, I can make documentaries and I can um, maybe show people different um, parts of like the planet and different issues and different perspectives, um, that'd be really cool. So that's what I've been doing. And I mean, I feel like filmmaking and the skills that you gain from filmmaking art can be kind of applied to anything. So I've had obviously a lot of experience writing scripts and everything, and that's really helped me with my speeches and my delivery with like different um, panel discussions and um, events. And then obviously the whole storyline. I mean, it's really important to have a story when speaking about different issues. Um, but also with my work with Re-Earth and Connect with Nature, we obviously, focus a lot on um, you know social media so editing skills you know filming videos and everything that's really important in this age of technology as well so yeah I've been lucky enough to be able to kind of combine these two and um, make something good out of it. I think it's such a cool way to combine the two things because it gives people a different perspective as well and it shows the issues in a different light um, so I guess you can attract new audiences and open people's eyes in that way as well, which I think is really good. Um, and you were also the UAE delegate at the COP26 um, earlier this year, I think. And I think you've drafted a second treaty and it's due for its second phase, or you've drafted a treaty and it's due for its second phase really soon. Um, so I was wondering what your objectives are and your aims with this treaty. So um, I'll give you a bit of context about Mark COP. Um, for people who might not know about it. Um, essentially, it was a um, conference that was um, created by youth. And basically, we were really angry that um, COP was postponed this year because it was supposed to be this November. Now it's next November. Um, and, you know, there were all these debates and discussions about, you know, climate change, this issue can't wait. I mean, why are you cancelling it? Just go digital, you have the resources, you have everything. Um, so again, as I said before, we took it upon ourselves to really um, create our own conference. So it was essentially led just like a normal um, COP conference would be, except it was like the mock COP. Um, so we had different speakers, panel discussions, um, and then we had applications for delegates um, to apply from every like all the different countries and of course there was a um, really big emphasis on um, the underrepresented countries as well so there were teams of delegates from each country and they all created their own kind of um, draft proposal of the things that they want to implement in their country 
and they would want to see their country um, kind of hit as targets. And then all of that was kind of taken all together with the help of some lawyers and all of that. And we created this huge treaty that we would then send to all the government representatives and to the United Nations, um, you know, representatives as well. So yeah, that was essentially our mission or aim to make it um, known that we, as you, like, we want action and we want to be taken seriously. And these are kind of our demands. Um, and we want all of these um, kind of quotas met. So for me, it really showed the power of youth um, and how really we can persevere. Um, yeah, I mean, if you want to read more about it, um, the treaty I think is on, our, on their website. Um, so if you go to Mock COP26, you'll see all the different um, things that we want to see in the future. Um, our next question for you is, are you optimistic about the COP26 in Glasgow? Mm -hmm. And do you think these climate agreements are actually taken seriously enough or are they just performative? Oof, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I, I would like to be optimistic. I've seen the previous conferences. Um, I mean, some countries have, um, you know, achieved what they said that they would achieve but many countries haven't kept their promises and they haven't um, done the work that they were supposed to do. So hopefully this year, maybe they'll finally realize how much of an emergency this is and actually will start taking this seriously. But previous years, it hasn't really been the case. Um, I mean, yeah, we had the Biden conference, I think about a month ago with all the different presidents um, kind of talking about what they have done and pledging different things. So I don't know. Um, it's really easy to be a bit hopeless sometimes, but I think this year there is a lot of pressure. Um, and especially with the pandemic, there's this new term called green recovery. And it's where um, nations really want to recover from this pandemic and turn like a new leaf and really um, change the way that their economies and countries are run. Um, in a more like sustainable way so hopefully that will happen um, but yeah I mean I, I think I, I have a few friends attending it this year um, so hopefully it goes well. I do hope so and like you said it's very easy to kind of feel hopeless sometimes and be a bit pessimistic but hopefully this year at COP26 is where we actually see some climate action instead of just false promises again and again um, and you've kind of touched upon this in the webinar today but I wanted to ask if you think young people's voices are being listened to enough when it comes to climate change? I think they are. I mean there are so many different organisations. Um, I guess Extinction Rebellion in the UK is the most prominent one um, but they have actually pushed a lot of different um, policies and they have achieved different um, targets that they set to achieve with the UK government and also governments around the world. Um, so, I mean, I think I've, I've been working with the UN and they are very optimistic and they are trying to, you know, help us as much as possible. And they're very engaged with what we have to say. Um, it's just a matter of kind of, not just listening, but also taking action and, not just listening to our feedback, but actually doing something about it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think we are the future. I mean, obviously, but <laughs> I'm very hopeful that, you know, whatever we do as young people, whatever careers we go into, um, that we do it with nature, with, with nature as like, with decisions about nature in uh, our hearts. So for example, if you're a businesswoman or businessman, you would be running this company, but I have faith that you'll run it in a way that is good for the environment. If you're a lawyer, maybe you'll want to be an environmental lawyer. If you're an architect, urban and green planning, sustainable development in, in these cities. So hopefully, if we all have this mindset about trying to protect our um, world, then with any job that we do, 
whether we're a teacher or I don't know anything we'll have it at the heart of all our decisions so we'll kind of all together change the way that it's run um, because right now I don't know with the other generations maybe the mindset is a bit different so yeah I think youth um, are really the key to everything. <laughs> Yeah, I completely agree. And hopefully we'll be able to pass that on to the future generations as well. And action will be able to be taken so that it's not too little too late. Um, but yeah, you've already achieved so much. But I think I was just kind of wondering what your aims are for the future and what you hope to achieve going forward. Um, well, for me, it's the same kind of goals as ever to just um, continue advocating and continue um, reaching out to as many students and like not just students but adults as well you know um, and trying to change the mindsets of people around me um, but yeah I mean I'm applying to university next year so <laughs> we'll see um, what I do and I feel like um, with universities and different organizations it's all a part of you know a feeling of community um, and the new opportunities that you're given so I hope to take any opportunity that comes my way and see where that leads me. Because I feel as though once you take one opportunity, then um, you're kind of on that path and then other opportunities related to that come up. So like, I mean, let's start with my Oxford <laughs> debate thing. You know, I, I did that and then that kind of propelled me to move forward to this thing. And then that became Nation Buster. Nation Buster led me to this webinar. So it's just a chain effect. So I hope that um, it kind of continues going like that and um, I can keep kind of advocating for the environment. Um, we love your answers for all the questions so far. And we have one final one for you. And it's what's your favorite project you've done so far? Ooh, um, I honestly couldn't say. I think it'd be so biased to like just pick one, um, but I've had a. I'll, I'll tell you the one that I just did. Um, so I'm very into like virtual reality and different emerging technologies and all of that, and arts as well. So um, I just had an exhibition where um, it was all about um, the UAE environment, and we have um, these boats called the Dows, which are very you know, big part of our history. Um, but of course they're being forgotten. So I kind of took these dows and kind of tried to recreate um, this like coral reef. So like if they were sunk into the sea, then they could positively affect the environment again. Um, because right now they're like in these like dumps um, and they call them like the dow graveyard. So if they're like under the ocean, they can um, positively affect like um, the coral reefs and there's this new biodiversity and people can like scuba dive and go in. So it was this like whole concept um, through this artwork that I was trying to convey. Um, that's why I love art as well so much, just like filmmaking. It really um, is a new tool and medium to kind of express these different ideas um, in a more creative and more understandable way. So that was really fun to do. Well, thank you so much for coming on today, Laura. And like, <laughs> you're a really interesting person that we've interviewed on our webinar so far. And some of the things you do are so creative and so amazing. And you're honestly really inspiring as a young person and all the things that you do. So yeah, once again, thank you so much for coming on today and speaking about what you do. Um, so yeah, I'll pass it on to Francis if he wants to say anything. Okay, uh, all I want to say is thank you to all of you. I mean, that was really, I, you're right, Olivia, that was an incredibly interesting, interesting interview because, Laura, you're doing so many things and all and the three of you, you're so passionate about what you do that it made it interesting. And, you know, when you listen to you, you know that we have every possibility about being optimistic for the future because your passion will drive that positivism through. So I think it's been a great interview and it's been really interesting. And I think we should do more of these where we have people from different countries talking together, seeing what they do and realizing that across the whole globe, we're all in this together, even me. So, you know, thank you all for doing it. And thank you, Laura, for 
joining us today. And I know it's much later there. Um, so that's great. So thanks all. And we'll end this interview now. Thank you.